Tonight, a notorious murder back in the national spotlight. Just this week, a wildly controversial parole decision is a convicted killer now walking free. And all new 2020 starts right now. Pound for pound, one of the greatest true crime stories of all time. This would turn out to be a notorious, surreal case. A woman brutally murdered in cold blood. Investigators at the time believed that Sherry Rasmussen was the victim of a burglary that had turned into her own murder. As I walked in, there was blood. She was literally clawing at the front door, trying to get out. People were on edge during that era. And add to that, we were the serial killer capital of the world. It's like being hit by a train. Just like being hit by a train. I don't usually talk about that day or that time. How soon was it after the murder that your father and your mother started to think that maybe this wasn't a robbery? I assumed it was going to be burglars, male burglars. And there was another piece of evidence that caught the attention of investigators. A bite mark on Sherry's forearm. A suspect that the LAPD could never have fathomed. If you walk down Hollywood Boulevard, you can't help but notice the stars on the sidewalk, the glitter in the pavement, and you think to yourself, wow, this is Tinseltown. But it doesn't take long until you realize that there are deep cracks in that pavement, exposing a criminal element you could never have anticipated. And the case of Sherry Rasmussen was a rude awakening for anyone living in La La Land. President Reagan in Los Angeles. Today, the torch entered the City of Angels for AIDS Walkathon in Hollywood. It was 1986. A beautiful young nurse, only three months into her marriage, is brutally murdered in her own townhome. As a television journalist, I've been reporting on true crime stories for decades on numerous outlets. And you think you're never going to be shocked anymore, ever again? Well, this proved all that very wrong. It was a huge story. It had all the elements, you know, sex and betrayal and lies. It just gripped the nation. It's definitely, uh, pound for pound, one of the greatest true crime stories of all time. Everything we always heard or was told about Aunt Sherry was about what a great person she was. Tell me about your sister. She was the middle. Uh, sister and she was a clown if everything got too serious she would make everybody laugh she had a very unique little giggle <laughs> <laughs> uncle john and aunt sherry are spending christmas with rachel on her first christmas sherry was all about family sherry was our glue she kept us all together From a young age, Sherry, the middle child with that infectious giggle, seemed mature beyond her years, according to her sisters, Connie and Teresa. She leapfrogged from the eighth grade into high school, and Sherry graduated early at the age of just 16 and enrolled in nursing school. She had certainly an interest in caring for other people. By the time she was 21, Sherry was fearless and determined, and she moved from her hometown of Tucson, Arizona, to Los Angeles. When she passed away, she was the director of critical care at the Glendale Adventist Hospital. When I think of Sherry, I think of her kindness and her generosity. Sherry's father, Nels, who was a dentist, had encouraged her to enroll in medical school to become a doctor, but she had other plans in mind. Sherry always wanted to have a family and a husband and children. In the spring of 1984, Sherry met a young engineer named John Rutten. John Rutten was a tall, handsome, bright, athletic young man from San Diego, California. 
Sherry was so tall, she often had difficulty finding guys who weren't intimidated by someone with her stature. And I know that John was just taken with her. Sherry and John were very happy together. Sherry was always smiling and laughing and happy. They settled at Sherry's condo in Van Nuys, and in November 1985, the couple got married. It was a joyous celebration. You could tell that they were in love. She was just beginning her life. She'd met the man of her dreams, and she had a great job, and she was doing very well, and it was all coming together. Three months later, and now it was all gone. February 24, 1986. John had just returned home from work, and as he's walking up the steps into the townhome, the door is ajar. He walks into the townhome and sees his gorgeous bride dead in a pool of blood on the living room floor. He calls 911. I was patrolling, and I got a call to Balboa Boulevard. Veteran LAPD patrol officer Rodney Forrest was one of the first cops to arrive at the scene. The call was a death investigation. I thought that was particularly interesting. Why a, a murder in a kind of upscale part of town? When Forrest and his partner got there, they were met with a grim warning from paramedics. Somebody said, you're not gonna be prepared for what's in there. And I'm thinking, well, I, I've seen it all, so let's go see. Oh, wow. Well, this brings back memories. It's kind of an eerie feeling to be here after uh, 30 plus, almost 40 years. As I walked in, I saw Sherry Rasmussen on the ground. She had been covered with a towel, and one of the paramedics raised the towel for me to see her face, and she had considerable trauma to her face. And there was blood. I thought after that, this is actually a murder. At that point, Officer Forrest called the LAPD's Van Nuys Division to notify the homicide unit, which took over the investigation. It's a horribly violent crime. Bruises all over her body. The struggle ensued for quite some time. My partner went upstairs, checked the upper floor for any suspects, and there were no suspects still around. Investigators knew that something catastrophic had happened to Miss Rasmussen. You think given the ferocity of that fight that somebody would have heard something? You would think it was a heck of a fight. I mean, Sherry fought for her life, literally. That night, news of Sherry's murder reached her family in Tucson. I'll probably never forget it, unfortunately. My dad called me to tell me that Sherry was dead. And I was like, that is... I, I certainly didn't believe it. Beyond the pale. Yeah, I was like, no, you're. What are you? What are you talking about? That's not true. And he said, no, it is. And then I started screaming. In the wake of Sherry's murder, her family struggled to understand what had happened. Could this be the result of the rampant violence that had plagued the city of Los Angeles in recent years? Grim statistics. For myself, as a reporter in Los Angeles, the 80s was the wild, wild west. Turn on the TV and what are you hearing about? Violent crime. Crime running unchecked. The police seemingly unable to stop it. That frustration reached the breaking point in one neighborhood in Los Angeles. Anyone that worked in the city of Los Angeles, they knew that they were going to have their hands filled. There are more than 100 street gangs in Los Angeles. It was out of control. 
People were on edge during that era. And add to that, we were the serial killer capital of the world. The Night Stalker killer. Strangled, tortured bodies were found sprawled on hillsides. By 1986, the homicide rate in Los Angeles had reached alarming levels. So when Sherry Rasmussen was murdered inside this apartment, it sent neighbors into a panic. It was a dark period in our history. People were terrified to leave their homes. Residents bought guns, learned martial arts. People had bought up every single burglar alarm in the city, and went to the L.A. County dog pound, and literally adopted every single dog for watchdogs. The home invasion murder, the one similar to Sherry's, is going to cause a lot of fear in the community. People were nervous. It was certainly a shock for me. Alan Tarski lived across the corridor from Sherry, but he says he wasn't home at the time of the murder. I had come back to work probably quarter to six in the evening, and it was shortly after that that the madness started. I do remember there was electronic stereo equipment right here that I saw when I came in. And that suggested to me that it was possibly a burglary and a burglary interrupted. I put this together with the stereo equipment stacked over here. And it seemed to me that she could have struggled with the burglar and she obviously lost that fight. Sherry's newer model BMW was taken. Her purse was taken. The Rasmussen crime scene had all the makings of something police call a hot prowl, a home invasion. Investigators at the time very much believed that Sherry Rasmussen was the victim of a burglary that had turned into her own murder. Based on what investigators could see at the time, it appeared as though Sherry Rasmussen was working at her dining room table on the second level of her condominium when the intruder came in through the front door. She had ligature marks on her wrists indicating at some point someone had tied her up. All over the place in these pictures you see some of the implements that were used to hit Sherry. Right. The vase that was smashed over her head. The shards had blood on them. The assailant or assailants were grabbing at anything they could find to make sure this woman didn't breathe another breath. Her fingernails were left broken at the front door. Because she was literally clawing at the front door. Trying to get out. But before Sherry could escape, she was shot, police say, at point-blank range. The bullets indicated that a 38 revolver had been used. It was basically an execution. Not a single neighbor heard a gunshot, and ballistics tests showed that it appeared the assailant had used that quilt over the barrel of the gun as a silencer. And there was another piece of evidence that caught the attention of investigators. A bite mark on Sherry's forearm. They took the sample in an abundance of caution because if there was blood there on that bite mark, it could be possible for blood typing uh, analysis to be done. I learned later about the bite mark that led into my curiosity of why there was a bite mark on her arm. I, I had no clue. It kind of reinforced what I was thinking when I initially got there. There was something up, something more than I originally saw. Former patrol officer Forrest, who wasn't part of the investigation, says to him the crime scene didn't jive with the burglary theory. I thought to myself, is, this is a, a burglary? Uh, burglars don't usually pick a place five condos from the street. They want to get away. They pick something next to the street. They don't want to be seen. It's just strange that they would pick this place. Officer Farr says he was also taken by the demeanor of Sherry's husband. I noticed John Rutten 
he was sitting at the table and he seemed to be sobbing. My reaction was his sobbing, his crying should have been more extreme with his wife laying there on the floor dead. I guess people grieve in different ways. Did you see John at any point directly after the murder? We saw him at the Van Nuys police station. And I do remember that he didn't have any marks on him. That's the first thing you, you look at for any kind of domestic violence. So, Even though he was your brother-in-law, even though you liked him, yes. the first thing you did when you saw him is sort of give him a visual a inspection, a yes. look over. Yes. Did you we, talk? We weren't allowed to talk to him. <laughs> They were keeping everybody separated. Because the first suspect in murders like this typically is... is... Rutten wasn't permitted to speak with Sherry's family, but on the night of the murder, he sat down with investigators at the LAPD's Van Nuys station. You didn't harm your wife, did you, John? The question for investigators is, was he telling them everything they needed to know to catch a killer? Sherry, we're living here in Southern California together. Yes. How was that? It was fun. Actually, we also gained Teresa. So all three of us were in a mobile home together at Loma Linda. Oh, wow. The three daughters. That must yep. have made your dad so happy. Yeah. I've kept a lot of Sherry's clothes. Now They're... it's all back in style, right? <laughs> the 1980s are all coming back. I remember her telling me that she had met John. What was your impression of him once you met him? He was very likable. They made a really a cute couple. They were both tall, thin, athletic, both driven with their careers. It was a whirlwind romance, and within a year, the two were married. And did she seem like she had it all? Yes. She had a new job that she enjoyed, just got married. She was a new aunt. We were really looking forward to the future. Family was just so important to her, and you can really see that in the photos and just how happy everyone was together. Sherry really loved Christmas. Here's the end, Sherry. It was one of her favorite holidays. Here's John holding his baby niece, Rachel. Everybody here thinks there's going to be a baby rotten pretty soon. I think they'd better talk to Sherry. <laughs> This would be Sherry's last Christmas. Sherry's now showing why she's a leader of nurses. <laughs> Just two months later, Sherry and John's love story came to a tragic and sudden end. And in the aftermath of her murder, questions would linger. When you're going through this process, you're pretty much helpless because you have no control. I mean, but the information you get is what they give you. Nels Rasmussen was determined to find out what really happened to his daughter. And so were the police who wanted answers. On the night of the murder, Detective Lyle Mayer questioned a very emotional John Rutten on what he knew about the day Sherry was killed. She had everything going. I mean, she, hey, so do you let her Hey, 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 hey John. John, for a couple of minutes, I need you to be tough for me, buddy. Investigators looked at every possible direction. Of course, they looked at John. What was the first thing you saw? Well, I saw Sherry lying on, and it's right in front of me when I walked in the door. I saw her lying on the ground. I knew right away that there was she was dead. He was shaken up that evening. He did his best to give an interview that helped investigators. At one point, Detective Mayer asked Rutten a very difficult question. You didn't harm your wife, did you, John? No, I didn't. You didn't harm your wife. Okay, very good. John Rutten agreed to do a polygraph examination, and the results came back inconclusive. But he had a rock-solid alibi. He was at work 
that day. He'd left work, he had stopped and picked up his dry cleaning, and then came back between 6 and 7 p.m. and found his wife murdered in the living room area of the house. Detective Mayer believed the murder had happened in the early morning hours after Rutten had already left for work. When I left, she was in bed, but she was away. What time did you leave for work? 7.20 is when I left. What time did you get to work this morning? I got to work about 10 to 8. In the eyes of Lyle Mayer, the lead detective, John Rutten was legitimately and seriously a grieving husband. They didn't feel he was hiding anything. And as far as they were concerned, he was not a suspect, and they told him so. I'm usually a pretty good judge of character, but I'm fairly certain that you have absolutely nothing to do with this. Okay? Mayer basically made a decision that night based on the evidence that he saw at the crime scene that this was a burglary gone wrong. I believe your house was burglarized today. Once those persons or that person or whoever was inside, I believe they were trying to steal your stereo and probably some other items. Why would they do anything to it? Why wouldn't they just run? I don't know, John. I don't know. John, things happen, okay? I think Sherry came down the stairs and I think she surprised him and she was hurt. She was shot. Oh, God. And Detective Mayer was so convinced he'd solve the case, he even told John Rutten. John, I know how you feel. I know what you're going through. But we're going to catch these persons, or this person, all right? You've got to have a little faith in me. But we're very successful at what we do. Very, very successful. At this point, detectives don't have a single witness. They have no murder weapon. They have no fingerprints. For even seasoned detectives, there's a lot of work ahead. But there will soon be a break in the case. These are sketches that were LAPD issued. Right. Would another home invasion in the same neighborhood lead investigators to Sherry's killers? different parts of the country but he had, he had almost the same haircut I know I was still in the stage of shock that this could happen to my sister it's like being hit by a train just like being hit by a train oh, I'm sorry I don't usually talk about that day or that time Less than a week after Sherry Rasmussen's murder, her loved ones said their painful goodbyes. A heartbroken John Rutten addressed family and friends. When I saw John at the memorial, he was just ashen. He couldn't stop walking in circles and was just shaking. And I want you to know that Sherry was the best professional in the world. She was the best wife that anybody could ever have. And she was the best sister, daughter, she wanted to make everybody happy. You have to understand that was a love in his life. And trying to deal with that grief is devastating. Back then, investigators wasted no time theorizing what they think happened to Sherry Rasmussen. They looked at the crime scene. It looked like a burglary, smelled like a burglary. Not long after Sherry's murder, investigators jump on a new lead. There's been another burglary here in this same Van Nuys neighborhood with a similar M.O. That burglary was interrupted by a woman coming home, seeing two men in her house, one of whom had a gun, and they fled. And witness sketches were produced of those suspects. These are sketches that were LAPD issued, right? These composites were attached to this case. They started to utilize that sketch in this case to see if 
the persons that were responsible for Sherry's death were the same people that were depicted in that sketch. Were they ever arrested? Were they ever found? No. It might as well have been me and you. Despite these suspects, there was literally nothing that could tie anyone directly to the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. On the surface, it appeared to be a burglary gone wrong, but not everyone was convinced. How soon was it after the murder that your father and your mother started to think that maybe this wasn't a robbery, like police were saying? The very day we went to the Van Nuys Police Department. That first day. It didn't make sense that they wouldn't take anything other than the car and yet fight with her to the extent of her death. Sherry's father, Nels, believed that there was another reason behind the murder because he says Sherry told him about a series of disturbing events in the weeks and months leading up to her death. My father told the police about an incident of a nurse that didn't get promoted and then she was upset with Sherry and then so she sort of got into an argument with Sherry. She felt that she had damage to her car so when Sherry was murdered that certainly came up to the forefront of my dad's mind that maybe that conflict accelerated. According to family members, there was another woman who raised alarm bells for her, an ex-girlfriend of John Rutten. She had come to Sherry's office after they were engaged, and I think she was sort of provocatively dressed and said to Sherry, when this marriage fails, I'll be waiting to pick up the pieces and Sherry said don't worry we won't be needing your services just about a month before the murder there was an even more disturbing encounter that Sherry again told her parents about she was home getting ready for work and heard something downstairs and went downstairs and found John's ex-girlfriend standing in the living room and Sherry told her to get out and not come back. In the days leading up to the murder, Nell said Sherry confided in him that she was being followed by someone who she described as having piercing eyes. Sherry never disclosed a name for the ex-girlfriend. It would have been nice had we had that because we would have shared that with the detectives. Nels claims that he told the original detectives about the alleged incidents involving an ex-girlfriend of Rutten. One of the original detectives in this case told me personally they had never heard any of those alleged incidents. And none of them were entered into the official case record known as the murder book. The single most important document in an LAPD homicide investigation is the murder book and it's basically the place where any investigative work that is conducted, any step that is performed, everything needs to be committed to writing and the reason that it's so important is that homicide is obviously a case with no statute of limitations. Nels Rasmussen told me that he had been telling them for years about an ex-girlfriend of John's. When exactly that conversation occurred, he could not tell me, but I believe that it occurred. But on the night of the murder, John Rudden told Detective Mayer that he didn't know anyone who might want to harm Sherry. She's not having any problems with an ex-boyfriend or you with an ex-girlfriend? No. Has anybody been hitting on her, following her home, or anything like that at all? I would say nothing out of the ordinary, you know, I don't, I don't think there was anything out of the ordinary. But Rutten says in the days and weeks following the murder, he did tell investigators about an ex-girlfriend, the same one Nell says he mentioned to police. Rutten says he never brought it up in his recorded interview with Detective Mayer because he never considered her a girlfriend. And it never crossed his mind that she could have been involved with Sherry's murder. 2020 reached out to Detective Mayer for a response to the allegations raised by Sherry's family and her husband, but he did not respond. 2020 also reached out to the LAPD regarding those same allegations, and they declined to comment. I had come to the conclusion in my mind that it was never going to be solved, and it was something that I would have to deal with. 
the unknown of what happened. With zero suspects, Sherry's homicide investigation was heading toward cold case purgatory. But years later, with brand new technology and a fresh set of eyes, investigators take another look at the bite mark that was on Sherry's forearm. And could that be the key that unlocks the mystery of the murder of Sherry Rasmussen? Times like this, I just need a tissue attached to me. <laughs> it has been very difficult to continue to live without Sherry. Sherry was like the bridge to, to kind of pull us all together. For Connie Rasmussen, the pain of losing her sister Sherry is felt most when she visits her grave near the family home in Tucson, Arizona. It's like a heavy weighted blanket sitting on you because you can't move because it's it's still unresolved when sherry was murdered my grandfather he was struggling with the fact that they were unable to find the murderer it ate at my dad you know as a father you think you know your job is to protect your children and he felt he had failed that Sherry's father, the late Nels Rasmussen, gave this interview shortly before his own death in 2020. It's probably difficult for people that know me that I hang on the way I do, but I'm learning every day how to deal with this. And I still don't have all the answers. I probably never will. In 1991, Lyle Mayer, who's the lead detective on the case, retires from the LAPD. And the case is then handed off to other detectives within the Van Nuys Homicide Unit. There were no active leads or items that were coming in at the time that were giving investigators new avenues to pursue. I never thought that time was going to help solve the case, that it was going to ever get solved. After Sherry's murder, time seemed to stand still for her family. But the decade that followed would bring a new chapter to the City of Angels. The beating of Rodney King. O.J. Simpson, who's a fugitive. Freeway that collapsed. Not guilty of the crime of murder. Lyle and Eric Menendez found guilty. Smalls was shot several times. The impact of El Nino. The Staples Center is just amazing. All beautiful and brand new. Mr. Gore, the Democratic nominee, is in Los Angeles. The Lakers gave L.A. one more thrill. 2001 was also a pivotal year for the Los Angeles Police Department. Marking the launch of the LAPD's cold case unit, that year detectives were handed over 9,000 unsolved murders spanning more than two decades. Sherry Rasmussen's case was one of them. I was a detective with the Los Angeles Police Department on the cold case squad. Her case was one of the last cases I looked at. In 2001, Detective Cliff Shepard would oversee the Rasmussen cold case investigation. Why does a case like this go cold for so long? Manpower, our uh, priorities within the police department. In fact, Shepard says Sherry's case had barely been touched for 10 years. Up to that point, nobody else had looked at it other than Mayor and myself, really. To get started, Shepard said, he made copies of select files from the Rasmussen murder book, creating his own Cliff's notes. Why not just take the murder book so you have all the evidence with you? Yeah, yeah. well, yes and no. Uh, our problem was space. 
We were in a little off as it wasn't practical to take the entire murder book. Breathing life into an old case is no easy feat, especially when you don't have all the evidence. Like a key piece of evidence relating to that bite mark found on Sherry's arm. When I was going back over the reports, they indicate that a bite swab had been collected. And when I looked at the evidence, no evidence for a bite swab. So I, I checked with our property. They verified they did not have the swab booked with our evidence room. There's no record of it. Generally speaking, how often does evidence go missing from a case file? Extremely rarely because there are professionals in the evidence rooms. There are professionals at the labs. They document everything. To track down the swab, Shepard enlisted the help of Jennifer Francis, a criminalist at LAPD's Scientific Investigation Division. And she had to make several calls and several searches had to be made before eventually the bite mark swab was located. Investigators are able to track down that missing bite mark evidence recovered from the murder scene. And the cold case team finds it here in a freezer at the L.A. County Medical Examiner's Office. The reason why it was way back in the freezer is because all those years ago it had been tested for blood type. And there it stayed all that time. By 2001, DNA technology had come into its own, so Francis sent out the swab for analysis. But Shepard says given the LAPD's case backlog, it would take two full years for the results to come back. And those results would eventually turn the entire case on its head. She informed me that I obtained a DNA profile. The DNA profile was entered into the law enforcement database, but there was no match at the time. So it was a big jump in the case, but it wasn't quite enough. It gave us a profile, but it didn't give us a name. With little else to go on, this case is riding on that piece of DNA. Once you got the DNA, did that prod you into doing any of the other investigative things like interviews? At that time, no, I couldn't. I had a lot of cases going on, so it was as I had time. I just didn't have enough time. My biggest regret is not interviewing Rutten, the husband. Not meeting with him and having a face-to-face. -face. I knew he restarted his life and it was down in the San Diego area. But for me to just leave LA and go down to San Diego to interview him, I had other things going on. I couldn't do that at that time. By 2005, Detective Shepard had moved on from the Rasmussen cold case investigation. Four more years would pass before there would be another significant development in the case. I'm not sure how much work was done between 2000 and... I can't remember ever covering a case like this. Sex, lies, law enforcement, innocent victim. Because what you could tell from the crime scene, there was an assailant, but that Sherry fought back. Oh, she did. Incredible yes. vigor and strength. Absolutely, she did. If I grab your arm, yeah, and you want to release my hand, what's very close, exactly? So Sherry Rasmussen knows this is a life and death situation. Sherry tries to escape. The co-counsel summarized the case as a bite, a bullet, a gun barrel, and a broken heart. Where she talked about her belief that there was a personal motive for this crime. For a cold case that was running on empty, I mean, this should have jump-started it. Why didn't it? It didn't give us a name. They eliminated the first four suspects, but they began to zero in on suspect number five. And suspect number five just happens to be a cop. Can you imagine that moment? After all these years, the answer is behind the badge. It's crazy that you've been working just down the hall from the murderer you've yeah. been looking for yes. for years. Yes.
February 24, 1986, investigators get a 911 call to respond to the condominium of John Rutten and Sherry Rasmussen. When they arrive, John is distraught. He has just found his newlywed wife laying on the living room floor. Sherry Rasmussen was attacked in her home, and bludgeoned, and then executed, shot three times while she was down on the ground. The investigators also found a bite wound uh, on her forearm. This will be important in the case because the bite marks will leave DNA. But in 1986, DNA testing was just in its infancy. Detectives don't have a single witness. They have no murder weapon. Nobody really saw anything. Detectives at the time characterized it as a burglary gone wrong. And the trail went cold for 15 years. But in 2001, the LAPD formed a new cold case unit to look into cases that would qualify for DNA testing. Investigators had reignited that cold case on the back of DNA evidence stored here. Criminalist Jennifer Francis, who'd been instrumental in tracking down and testing the bite mark swamp, had a stunning revelation. It was female DNA. I assumed it was going to be burglars, male burglars. Uh, a female? Who is she? Once you got the DNA, you realized it was a woman. Were you curious about the fact that a woman might have been involved? I was curious what woman. This could be the break that the LAPD needs. I think there are times that we felt Cherry's case would never be solved. But with the results of the DNA, it gave us renewed hope that Sherry's killer would be brought to justice. The DNA analysis that revealed Sherry was bitten by a woman seemed not to have any effect on the direction of the LAPD's investigation. Because what you could tell from the crime scene is that there was an assailant, but that Sherry fought back oh, she with did. incredible Yes. Vigor and strength. And I thought, okay, we've got one with the gun, doesn't want to use it. The other one's, you know, presumably the female who helps her partner out when she, he's starting to get beaten up. By 2005, Detective Shepard had moved on from the Rasmussen cold case investigation. The bite mark came back to a female when it was tested for DNA back in 2005. For a cold case that was running on empty, I mean, this should have jump-started it. Why didn't it? It didn't give us a name gave us a profile, but it didn't give us a name. Four years went by with no forward momentum. But in 2009, a detective by the name of Jim Nuttall, assigned to the Van Nuys Division, received the Rasmussen case file to check for updates as part of cold case standard procedure. One of the first things that Nuttall notices is this four-year-old DNA report by Jennifer Francis that indicates that it was a woman who attacked and killed Sherry. And he just isn't buying the burglary story. Near the door, there were stacked stereo components, which ostensibly you'd think the burglars were going to grab on their way out. It made him believe that the murder occurred first and that they were intentionally left there. Nuttall and his team of detectives believe that this may have been personal. They conduct new interviews with those close to Sherry, including her parents and her husband, John Rutten. He wanted to exclude all of the potential female sources or female individuals that were surrounding Sherry's life at the time. The detectives make a list of five women in Sherry's orbit and eliminate them as suspects one by one. Sherry's mother and sister Teresa were on the list, as was her good friend, Jane Goldberg. They took my DNA, the one detective came unannounced, and he said, I'm just coming to get a DNA swab. The first three suspects on the list were able to be eliminated almost immediately. The fourth name on the list was a nursing colleague. There was an indication of uh, tension and bad blood between them. Investigators obtained a DNA sample from her, which didn't match that from the bite mark. They eliminated the first four suspects, but they began to zero in on suspect number five. It's suspect number five 
that grabs the attention of detectives. Rutten told Detective Nuttle all about an old friend and former romantic partner named Stephanie Lazarus. Once number five was developed by Detective Nettle, Detective Nettle uh, spoke to John Rutten again to learn a little bit more about his connection with Stephanie Lazarus. We want to walk you through a, a timeline. It's, it's very important. Um, starting, we believe we're close, but we'll have to have you kind of spell this out for us. Rutten tells Detective Nuttall that Stephanie Lazarus is a name he's already given to detectives decades earlier. I know that she went to go see Sherry, and I know that she was upset, you know, that we weren't going to have the relationship. That's the reason for identifying her. So that's the reason I identified her 23 years ago, you know, when we talked. One of my concerns is that that was never, you know, appears to be recorded. And we know files. And I'm not trying to be lost. inflammatory. There's a certain level of frustration on our part. Yeah, more I, should I have been. That. More should have been documented. We're now forced, 23 years later, to literally almost start over again because we just we lack the documentation uh, that would have been crucial in this case. There's no official record of Rutten mentioning Lazarus at the onset of the investigation, but there is a single reference made in the case file nearly two years after the murder. And it's a notation along the lines of John Rudden called Stephanie Lazarus, P slash O, ex-girlfriend. And when John Rutten spoke with the cold case detectives, he confirmed the meaning behind that P slash O. I gave him the name and I said she's a police officer. Not only was Lazarus a police officer, but she's still on active duty as a detective. Think about this. You're the cold case unit investigating one of your own. And her office is just down the hall on the third floor of police headquarters. Police like to talk. That's why they're cops. They ask questions. These cops needed to keep this quiet. For over two decades, Sherry Rasmussen's murder went unsolved. Until 2009, when cold case investigators began zeroing in on Stephanie Lazarus, a 25-year veteran of the LAPD. She had been hiding in plain sight all along. She presented herself as very smart, capable, athletic. She was uh, a Division I athlete. Lazarus's connection to the Rasmussen case was through Sherry's husband. Her history with John Rutten went back more than 30 years when they first met as students at UCLA. And Stephanie made no bones about the fact that she envisioned a big romantic future with John Rutten. The problem is that John has never, in his own words, looked at her in the same way. After Stephanie graduated from UCLA, she joined the LAPD in the early 1980s. At a time when the department was striving to bring more women onto the police force. She seemed to excel and do well in specialized assignments, but it's, it was always competitive. And that competitive fire coupled with being a stellar athlete was a perfect entree for Lazarus to participate in the California Police Olympics. The California Police Olympics were an athletic competition open to police officers throughout the state. Anita Ortega was one of the other few female LAPD officers at the time and a teammate of Lazarus. Stephanie was an outstanding athlete and a basketball player. I thought her tenacity was incredible. She never quit. She may have been tenacious on the hardwood, but off the court, Anita got to know a softer side of her teammate. Seemed like a very nice person, always energetic, um, just happy-go-lucky kind of person. Really enjoyed hanging around her. Stephanie shared with me that she, um, she met her boyfriend, John, at UCLA. Said he was a great guy. I never met him, but I thought they were going to get married. Thing was, not only was Lazarus not dating John in the summer of 1985, he was engaged to Sherry Rasmussen. Stephanie never mentioned Sherry to me or the fact that 
John was in another relationship. But entries in Lazarus' own diary seem to reveal her despair after learning that Rutten was getting married. Stephanie Lazarus had a 600-page diary. What was the story that it told? There were these tidbits of information right up to the wedding, right up to the killing, where she was indicating to herself how despondent she was. Despite her apparent inner turmoil, to outside appearances, Lazarus seemed upbeat and happy. She had a really nice smile, bright eyes, just a real positive kind of personality about her. Fitness trainer Brian Brazzi says he had an immediate connection with Lazarus, but then just a few weeks after meeting, Brazzi says there's an odd encounter at his apartment. There was a knock on my door to female police officers fully uniformed at my door, Stephanie Lazarus being one of them. Showing up unannounced, I had never given her my address. Rossi says it's an uncomfortable moment, and he doesn't invite the women into his one-room studio apartment. Stephanie had shown up for reasons unknown, he says, and just as quickly, she leaves. I really didn't know what to say or how to react. Brazzi says despite his discomfort over that visit, the two decided to go out on a date anyway. But when he later had to break the date, Brazzi says he saw a different side of Lazarus. The next time I saw her, the look that, that she gave me was like just dark and menacing. And I just kind of stopped in my tracks. By the spring of 1986, after Sherry Rasmussen's murder, Lazarus's career at the LAPD was thriving. Daryl Gates and the rest of the LAPD brass loved Stephanie Lazarus because having her face out there, her exuberance, her athleticism, it got people excited. She was a walking, talking recruitment drive. She even made an appearance on the game show Family Feud pitted against arch rivals, the L.A. Fire Department. She continued on a, an upward trajectory, and she became a detective for the Los Angeles Police Department. In 1992, she was assigned to the personnel division as a background investigator, someone interviewing and passing judgment on applicants to the LAPD. It seems eventually Stephanie puts John Rutten behind her. She marries another police officer, and the couple adopt a beautiful young daughter. One of her last assignments was to be assigned to the art theft detail, a very specialized division. The art theft detail investigated anything that was of value that was stolen as art. At the time, the unit was the only one of its kind in the country, and with its rich and famous clientele, attracted local media attention. I was a contributing writer to the LA Weekly, and I had heard about Don Harisic, who ran the art theft detail. So he reluctantly agreed to do an interview with me. Also in attendance, the junior member of the unit, Detective Stephanie Lazarus. Every time I talked to Don Harisic, Stephanie Lazarus interrupted me, and she kept interjecting snide, sarcastic, and semi-humorous comments after my questions, it was extremely disruptive. I asked Detective Lazarus, what do you know about art? And her answer was, it hangs on the wall. By 2009, the future looks bright for Stephanie Lazarus. She has a family now and is working in a prestigious unit. She seemed like the happiest, luckiest person uh, in LAPD. All seems great. She has no clue but a net is closing in around her. Hey, Frank. Hi. Sure, that's nice to see you guys. How's it going? Good. Have a seat. It's June of 2009, and Stephanie Lazarus has unwittingly walked into her own interrogation for the murder of Sherry Rasmussen. It's been four months since cold case detective Jim Nuttall first opened the case file and started carefully and 
quietly piecing together what he believed happened 23 years earlier. When detectives zeroed in on Stephanie Lazarus, one of their own, it appeared that they really wanted to keep that close to the vest. How important and how difficult was it to keep this under wraps and keep it secret? The detectives took every effort to scrub her name from their investigation. Any references to her at that point were only oblique references like suspect number five. You know, it's difficult to track your own and know that one of your own has been accused of a crime or, or something illegal. And to complicate matters, Lazarus's office is right down the hall from robbery homicide. So the determination was made to not contact Stephanie Lazarus directly and to collect a sample of her DNA surreptitiously. This is where the special investigation section comes into play. Now this group, SIS, their job is watching Stephanie, following her, and get evidence. As luck would have it, she went to Costco a couple days after the surveillance had started, and she had a drink. And once she discarded that drink, the officers were able to collect her cup without her knowing it. And when you collect the DNA from the cup, you match it against whoever the suspect number five is, what did they get? They matched her DNA to the bite mark sample. Can you imagine that moment? After all these years, and now we know the answer is behind a badge. The DNA is a match, but cold case detectives still have to confront her face to face. One of the detectives approaches Stephanie one day in her office, and he says something to the effect of, you know, Stephanie, we've got this suspect who seems to know about some big art heist. He's down in the lockup. We need to bring you down there. Instead, it was just another detective. And so that was the stage that was set for that interview. We've been assigned a case that we've been looking at. Okay. okay. It's a new case. So through the course of this police interview with Stephanie Lazarus, they are recording. She doesn't know. Do you know John Rudin? John Rudin? John Rutten? Rutten. Rutten. Oh, yeah, I went to school with him. What, what's this all about? Well, it's relating to uh, his wife. Immediately, they start talking about the Sherry Rasmussen murder. Do you know what the circumstances were regarding her death? Mm. Jeez, let me think back. Um, geez, I don't know if it was, you know, if it was a burglary or something. She's using every skill she has to talk her way out of being connected to this in any way. Connected to the crime or her old flame, John Rutt. We dated. Um, I can't say that he was my boyfriend. I don't know that he would consider me his girlfriend. The detectives were able to get Stephanie Lazarus to confirm that she had gone to her hospital to speak with, with Sherry Rasmussen. And yeah, I may have met her at a hospital. But being that you're kind of used to see uh, John, you know, was it everything okay between you guys? I mean, there was never anything uncomfortable or anything between you and her? You know, I don't know. I mean, it's, God, it's been so many years. You're probably a student of liars at this point in your career. Does that seem like a particularly adept liar to you? It was gold for us because we had all of the evidence that disproved everything that she was saying. Finally, when they say to her, we think we've got DNA from the crime scene, boom. Because now, 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 because now, now I'm thinking I probably need to talk to a lawyer. Okay. I mean, well, I because I know how this stuff works. Okay. She knows. She absolutely she knows. knows. She knows at that point that she talked way too long. And now it almost sounds like you're trying to pin something on me. When the interview ended, you can hear her getting arrested. Murder. Murder. 
Stephanie, you know you have the right to remain silent. Do you understand? Yes. You want to talk to us right now? No. <laughs> All right. Okay. This then. is crazy. At this point, had you heard the name Stephanie Lazarus? No. Not only Lazarus I knew was the man raised from the dead that Jesus did. That's it. This is the case that rose from the dead. Uh, yeah, it did. On the third floor of Parker Center this morning, police detectives arrested one of their own. Detectives assigned to the Los Angeles Police Department's Robbery Homicide Division, Cold Case Squad, arrested Los Angeles Police Detective Stephanie Lazarus. It's crazy that you've been working just down the hall from the murderer you've um, been looking for yes. for years. Yes. Stephanie Lazarus didn't quite serve and protect, did she? Uh, no. When they said it was a police officer, I went, you're kidding. Absolutely kidding. A police officer committed this crime. I, I, I couldn't imagine that. I was very shocked, but I also know how effective DNA testing is. And it, it kind of made me realize that, yeah, Stephanie must have committed the murder. They were kind enough to come to our home and let my parents know that they had made the arrest. I mean, I cried because I was so excited Number one, that justice for my sister, but also for my dad. I was so relieved and so happy and so sad. We had waited so long, but at last. I'm totally in shock. It was just a stunning turn of events. Then a whole new chapter begins. The prosecution is armed with what appears to be rock-solid evidence. But this is L.A. after all, and strange things have been known to happen in court. So, you have to wonder, would a jury really believe a veteran detective is capable of committing a cold-blooded murder? Twenty-six years after Sherry Rasmussen was murdered, the Stephanie Lazarus case finally comes to a courthouse here in downtown Los Angeles. The Los Angeles police detective accused of murdering her rival? That sounds more like a Hollywood blockbuster than a decades-old cold case finally going to trial. At her arraignment, Stephanie Lazarus pleaded not guilty to the charge of first-degree murder. There was a lot of buzz in the air, folks across the country very interested in this case. Why wouldn't they be? It's sex, lies, law enforcement, an innocent victim. I covered the trial from A to Z, had a side view at Stephanie Lazarus. She sat in that orange jumpsuit. What a dichotomy from her police blues. The co-counsel summarized the case as a bite, a bullet, a gun barrel, and a broken heart. Right it highlighted all of the strong pieces of evidence. So the bite mark, of course, referred to the DNA evidence found on Sherry Rasmussen's left forearm. The prosecution considered this their ace in the hole. You had four separate analyses done. So by far, that was the most important piece of evidence. To explain how the bite mark got there, prosecutors presented their theory of how they believe Stephanie Lazarus was able to attack and kill Sherry Rasmussen. Stephanie Lazarus points the gun. Sherry grabs the arm. If I grab your arm, yeah, and you want to release my hand or get me to release my I hand, try to do this. Or... You could you could grab me, or what? What's very close? Exactly. And the prosecution described the terrifying details about how they say Sherry attempted to escape with her life. Stephanie Lazarus fires that gun twice, and two shots go out the back slider. So Sherry Rasmussen knows this is a life and death situation. Sherry tries to escape, and she goes down these stairs. She did not get out. They collected her fingernails at the front door. Because she was literally clawing at the front door. Trying to get out. Stephanie was able to get her to the living room floor and hit her over the head with the pottery and hit her again with the firearm in the face. 
at that point, Stephanie grabs this quilt and wraps the gun with this quilt. And she muffles the sound of those gunshots by putting that quilt right up to Sherry's chest and shooting three times. Then there was the matter of the so-called broken heart described by the prosecution. Sifting through her diary, there were these tidbits of information where she was having contact with John Rutten. She would see John, she would follow John, she would stalk John. In Lazarus's journal, she wrote things such as, I saw John Rutten's car. I put a note on it and watched the car for half an hour. I did visit John Rutten, but his girlfriend was over. I really didn't feel like working, too stressed out about John. I have a real hard time concentrating these days. When Stephanie's journals were entered into evidence, it clearly identified to me that she really never gave up on her obsession with John. John Rutten testified about his love for his wife and how he did not expect or know that Stephanie was capable of committing this crime. Rutten said he never once promised anything to Stephanie. He described a friendly relationship that involved casual sex. But then he made a jaw-dropping admission, something he had told investigators back in 2009. After he got engaged, he gets a call from Stephanie. He reveals that somehow they ended up in bed and had sex. When John was on the stand, I learned for the first time that he had relations with the defendant shortly before marrying my sister, and that was very devastating. When it came time for the defense to present its case, Lazarus's attorney, Mark Overland, tried to cast doubt on the chain of custody on the bite mark swab, suggesting that the evidence was tainted and Lazarus may have been framed. The envelope that the vial was stored in was found in a pretty ratty condition. He showed it to the jury. Would you trust this? You don't know who opened that vial. The strength of this evidence is that each piece was collected over a course of a long period of time, which would have made framing Stephanie Lazarus extremely implausible, if not impossible. In his closing argument, defense attorney Mark Overland claimed those journal entries didn't amount to obsession, arguing John was mentioned only five times among almost 600 pages. After almost three weeks of trial, the case went to the jury. They returned with a verdict in less than two days. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Stephanie Eileen Lazarus, guilty of the crime of murder of Sherry Rasmussen. It was just like a rush of relief that it's over. Relief for my father that he finally was vindicated and he had his answers. Stephanie Lazarus' sentencing hearing was held in March of 2012. This is People versus Stephanie Lazarus. The matter is set today for sentencing. A statement from Nels Rasmussen was read by the prosecutor. Sherry was a beautiful, talented, gifted person and a loving daughter. Her senseless death caused pain that will never, ever heal. And John Rutten tried to describe the heavy burden it seems he will carry for the rest of his life. John, I'm John Rutten. The fact that Sherry's death occurred because she met and married me brings me to my knees. I have resigned myself to trying to endure the daydreams about a world where Sherry is still with us. And this pointless tragedy never occurred. Thank you, Mr. Rutten. The judge is about to announce Stephanie Lazarus' sentence for first-degree murder and use of a gun. The court will now pronounce sentence. But this case is far from over. Sherry Rasmussen's friends and family have no idea about the shocking turn of events that await them in the not-too-distant future. Will a killer walk free? March 2012, and Stephanie Lazarus has just been found guilty for the murder 
of Sherry Rasmussen. Never admitting guilt, Lazarus waved goodbye and smiled to her family as she left the courtroom. What was her sentence? She received 25 to life first degree murder and two years for the use of a gun. There had never been an arrest of an active LAPD detective for murder under circumstances this salacious, a cold case. And once the Rasmussen stepped forward, allegations of a cover-up. LAPD should want to know why it took so long, and there should be accountability for that passage of time. The Rasmussen's took action in two ways. One was to file a complaint directly with the LAPD, alleging a cover-up to protect Officer Lazarus from criminal prosecution. They also filed a civil lawsuit against the LAPD, making the same allegation. The day that Stephanie Lazarus was arraigned, the Rasmussen's asked to get answers as to what happened in 1986 and what happened that nothing was done despite our repeated requests. The LAPD denied the Rasmussen's allegations, citing immunity, and the lawsuit was eventually dismissed because of the statute of limitations. As for the complaint the Rasmussen's filed directly with the LAPD, the LAPD's Internal Affairs Department launched an investigation in response to the allegations. Journalist Matthew McGough obtained a copy of the Internal Affairs file which wasn't released publicly. A total of 6.8 hours were devoted to trying to determine whether or not Stephanie Lazarus was protected in an internal cover-up. More than a year passed before it was closed with no one being interviewed, no investigative conclusions. The Rasmussen complaint was classified as unfounded because the judge had dismissed the LAPD from any liability. 2020 reached out to the LAPD with questions about the handling of this case, and they declined to comment. While the Rasmussen family continued to raise questions about why Lazarus was not arrested for so long, they were certain that she'd spent at least decades behind bars. But just last November, there was a development that took everyone by surprise. It was late 2023 when Stephanie had her first appearance before the California Parole Board. This was years before anybody thought she'd be eligible for early release. It turns out in the years since Lazarus's conviction, the state of California passed a new law giving special consideration towards paroling so-called youthful offenders who had committed their crimes when they were under the age of 26. Lazarus was 25 when she murdered Sherry Rasmussen. Letters supporting Lazarus's release were submitted to the parole board by friends, family, and fellow prisoners. She took responsibility for committing the murder for the first time, something that she had denied throughout her trial and throughout her incarceration until all of her appeals were exhausted. She showed absolutely no remorse and brushed it off as if my aunt Sherry did not fight her, then she wouldn't have fight back, that she wouldn't have killed her. The only reason she confessed is because she wants to get out on parole. And at the conclusion of that parole hearing, Lazarus, to the outrage of many, was granted parole. What was your reaction to her being granted this parole? It was a miscarriage of justice. However, before that decision became final, California Governor Gavin Newsom intervened in the case and requested it go to the full parole board for reconsideration. Have you made it your mission to try to keep Stephanie Lazarus behind bars? Yes. I mean, I'm going to do everything in my power. In a follow-up hearing with the full parole board, Sherry's supporters came out in force to argue against Lazarus' release. Moderator, we will now take speakers in opposition to Stephanie Lazarus. She deceived and lied to everyone for almost 40 years. How can this board believe that she has changed? Before he died, Sherry's father, Nels Rasmussen, recorded a video message to be played in the event that Stephanie Lazarus ever came up for parole. 
if one looks at the damage that she did to my daughter's face, it's almost like she wanted to destroy the beauty that Sherry exuded. The board's earlier decision to approve parole was put on hold pending yet another review. I still expect the worst and prepare for our next step when that happens. And what's that next step? Just keep fighting. For the family and everyone else concerned, the day has arrived where we'll find out if Stephanie Lazarus is released or remains behind bars. My dad had a boat down in San Diego. We enjoyed the ocean and the beaches. Was part of your father lost when the killer wasn't found? I think I would say yes. I mean, she was just glued to my dad. We have lots of pictures of them just arm in arm. And he never stopped fighting for her? Nope, never. And that struggle to keep Sherry's killer behind bars came to a head just this week as parole officials met for the third time to determine Stephanie Lazarus's fate. I served as the pool reporter for the parole rescission hearing held for Stephanie Lazarus. After Lazarus, her attorney, and all the victim's family and representatives had spoken, the commissioners announced that they would adjourn uh, to deliberate, and after about 25 minutes or so, announced their decision. Stephanie Lazarus will not be released from prison, at least for now. A panel decided to rescind her parole. The parole board's decision in the hearing was unanimous. Lazarus did not speak um, about the crime itself or express any remorse to the family members of Sherry who were, who were there. She was denied parole. It's most likely that she would appeal it and ask for another parole hearing every year. So the victim's family will go through this every year. And as long as Stephanie Lazarus tries to win her freedom, Teresa, Connie, and their children say they'll continue the fight to keep her behind bars. Teresa and I have continued to battle on behalf of our sister, Sherry. We really have to keep her in because she has no regard for what she did. She does not have remorse. I remember promising my grandparents that we would always continue the fight. We're fortunate enough to have three children, all girls. Sherry was the middle one. But in many respects, Sherry was the one that held not only her sisters together, but uh, her mom and dad. My Aunt Sherry no longer being with our family has left a hole that can never be filled. The memories we could have had. How would you like Sherry to be remembered? She was a very kind-hearted person. She was funny. <laughs> she was just a wonderful, wonderful person who touched everybody she came in contact with. I think about her every day. I mean, I have this picture in my house. I wake up, I see her. I don't think Sherry is ever gone. She's always here. Sherry Rasmussen's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Stephanie Lazarus in 2016 and won a judgment of $10 million. It'll be four months before Stephanie Lazarus is eligible for a new parole hearing. That is our program for tonight. I'm David Muir. Thanks for watching. And I'm Deborah Roberts. From all of us here at 2020 and ABC News, good night.
Tonight, a love story that turns into a lost story. A lost mom of two young boys, that is. Plus a key witness, Deborah, who asks the police to pray with her before she tells them what she knows. An all-new 2020 starts right now. She was a wonderful mother. She loved her boys more than anything, more than her own life. A young woman who is a parent suddenly it disappeared. Was there anything suspicious in the car? And we saw in the back seat there were car seats, you know, for the two boys. But to disappear without them? That was impossible. That was not Laura. She drops off the map. This wasn't going to be just a normal missing person. Oh, baby, don't go. Oh, baby, don't leave He knew how to charm a lady and charm the crowd alike. And then it wasn't too much longer later that Amanda came into the picture. What did Grant tell your mom? about Laura. That she was crazy, she was mentally unstable. He lied. And here was a document that said she sold her kids for $25,000. And they were like, well, Laura's missing. And I was like, wait a freaking second. Are you sure? What are you thinking at this point? Something is really wrong. got to be sick and deranged. What would drive anybody to commit such a crime? Wherever she is, her heart is breaking. The search continues. There's been cases I investigate I don't even remember, but then there's some that while you're in the midst of it, you know this one was just different. Horseshoe Creek is notorious for alligators. That's just a long, meandering creek. It's a small creek, slow moving in that area. Very dark, murky, muddy water has zero visibility it's heavily wooded there's a lot of lily pads all the lily pads literally took off the creek it was the perfect place to get rid of what they wanted to get rid of this is oyster creek a quiet spot about 30 miles outside houston texas on a hot steamy july day just like this one back in 2011 Police divers were scouring these murky waters, searching for clues in the disappearance of a young mom. But Laura Ackerson was last heard from 1,200 miles away from here in North Carolina. Wednesday, July 13th at 4.19 p.m. Hi, ladies. I'll be here in about an hour, but um, I'm going to go visit with my boys. Don't know what's going to happen as far as I'm concerned. Laura left that voicemail for a friend she promised to visit later that night. Meanwhile, another friend and business partner, Siobhan Mathis, was also waiting to hear from her. It was just very odd that it was going straight to her voicemail because she always had that phone on. I walked to her house, but um, it's gated and locked and you can't get in, but I can see into the garage and her car wasn't there. Then she sends her an email, I'm really worried. Um, if you don't get up with me, I'm gonna call the police. Siobhan was getting more and more worried with every passing second. And she decided to report Laura missing. I don't wanna think the worst, but it's almost like what else is there to, you know, to think. Police in Raleigh, North Carolina start looking into Laura Ackerson's background. They find out she's a small town girl from Michigan. Roger Ackerson was her dad. She was curious. She wanted to learn things. She'd crawl up in my lap with a book, want me to read to her. Laura's parents divorced when she was just a toddler. As she grew older, it was clear she had a bright spark. Full of dreams. She could see beyond the end of her nose, where a lot of people can't. Everybody she met, she would always see the good in everyone. She didn't become the valedictorian of her high school class because she didn't want to do all the work. But a couple of years down the road, she said, boy, I wish I had. After high school, she moved to North Carolina and landed a waitressing job. That's where she met Heidi Schumacher. We were working at Applebee's together. Her first day, I was training her. I, you know, 
was a little snippety at her and she said, you're not going to talk to me like that. Nobody had ever stood up to me before. And I said, oh, you know what? I smiled at her and I said, well, let's go out tonight. <laughs> We're going to be great friends. <laughs> And then when Laura turned 23, she had an announcement to make. And she was like, oh my gosh, I have a surprise for you. And I said, okay, well, happy birthday, because it was on her birthday. And I was like, okay, what is the surprise? She's like, okay, it's a guy. And I said, oh, all right, surprise, it's a guy. So she was on the floor, food in the pan. What makes a man? Oh, Grant Hayes was a aspiring musical artist. Show me a man. I'll show you a man. He was known to Raleigh area. Talk to her sweetly, tell her no lie. Raleigh is a place we call the New South. It's a great mix of people coming from all over the country, raising their families. It's big enough that you have a city atmosphere, but it also has some small town values. Downtown Raleigh is kind of burgeoning, and so there are all these you know new bars and restaurants and. Um, he was a musical act who would play at a lot of these places. Are you still with me when I'm gone? Are you still with me when I don't come? People liked his music. People liked his vibe. Great Hayes, we love you. And she said, we share a birthday. We're so connected. She thought it was some sort of cosmic intervention that they were supposed to meet and they were supposed to be together. We were always together and and she was smitten. She was. And he was, you know, he's a nice looking guy. He's charismatic. And so seeing that, I think maybe a little bit of starstruck. I grew up in the in the pew, little Grant the Third, watching my father preach and um, my mother would sing. And they've always been a huge inspiration. Grant was known by his last name, Hayes. He thought he could get some more buzz by changing H-A-Y-E-S to H-A-Z-E Hayes. She was kind of in awe of what he did. See, he would go through bars and he'd take his guitar and he'd sing songs. I'm working with some iconic figures in history, you know, music history. Little Richard, godfather of rock and roll. Laura and Grant fell in love very quickly. She goes, I ha my surprise is that I just got married. And I said, oh my gosh, awesome. She just was a spur-of-the-moment kind of person, so it didn't really surprise me, I guess, that she would just meet somebody and get married to them. And she was, like, ecstatic at that moment. Laura got pregnant very early on, and she had a little boy named Grant the Fourth, always referred to as Little Grant. What she told me after she delivered the baby was that she was very happy because when Grant walked in and saw him, he fell in love with the baby. Oh, baby, don't go. Oh, baby, don't leave. Heidi was not a fan of Grant Hayes, and she was very clear about that. We have had hateful tension between us since the moment we met. And she said, why can't you just be happy for me? I said, I know, but I just got this really bad feeling from him. And, you know, and she, she would say that I was just trying to protect her and... I was just being an overprotective friend and, you know, all that, and so I backed off. Soon, an opportunity in the Caribbean takes Laura and Grant's lives in very different directions. Party, stay out late, stay up all night. They were kind of living two separate lives. There was something simmering underneath that in the relationship. There may have been trouble there in paradise. St. John is a really quaint, quiet island. It's about 4,000 people. It's a magical place. It's a fantastic place. It's got an affluent clientele that goes there because 80% of the island's national park. It can't even be developed. Uh, yeah, there is no airport. So the only way to this island is by boat. You're going to take your flight to St. Thomas, and you're going to have to take a passenger ferry. St. 
St. John's attracts musicians from all over. Kenny Chesney owns a home here and a local island hangout. His music here in Raleigh, but he thought he could take the next step in his career with music by going to the U.S. Virgin Islands. Jose, who asked us only to use his first name, booked musicians into the bars and nightclubs on the island. My phone rang and it was Grant. He explained that he was looking to make sure that he could get enough gigs to support his basic costs of living. I promised him that I could get him five shows a week. So he packed up and went down there. He did speak of his son and Laura and that she was going to eventually come down here once he got settled. The Caribbean could be very seductive with the night air, the breezes, the music, the sand. When the sun goes down is when it really comes alive. Chica, chica, love me. He knew how to work his crowd and play the right music for the people in the audience. And I was listening to him play and I really liked his sound. You know the artist Chardet? He was like a male version of her. It just kind of a groovy, smooth vibe. Show me a man. I'll show you a man. He definitely had some similarities to someone like Darius Rucker. I own a bar on the island of St. John. How I first encountered Grant Hayes. He was playing, I believe it was at the Parrot Club. He was taking a break. He said, man, I really dig your sound. I'll bring some people from my bar down. And he says, really? From your bar? Yeah. You know, but they won't be spending money with you if they're not at your bar. Then we'll have a good time. He was just waiting for that one guy to come in that's on vacation that might be with a record company. To actually identify and recognize that this guy has talent and let's make him an offer. But for now, he had to make do with paychecks of $150 to $200 per gig. It looked from the outside looking in that Laura and Grant had a great relationship. No one really knew the trouble brewing. He was very possessive. It was like he owned her. Grant didn't want her to have a relationship with her brother. He did not want any close relationships except for the one with him. Well, she had pretty effectively been isolated from everyone else in her life. I mean, he would take her self-esteem and just crush it out of the ground. I, you know, got to the door and she answered and she had a bloody nose and a, like, almost black eye already. I tried to get the girl to the hospital or file a police report or anything. Like, no, 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 he won't do it again. It's, it's okay. It's going to be okay. I'm not going to press charges. It's fine. She's an optimist. She thought, well, he may change eventually. Always looking for the better side of him. Grant denied ever hitting Laura. Now she's planning to join him on St. John. But then she says she receives a stark warning from family and friends. I told her, don't go back. You don't need to go back to that. She really realized, man, I don't, you know, I, I have to leave him. And I said, okay. And then we had a plan for her to leave, and she had gotten sick like three or four mornings in a row. And she was pregnant. And I said, you can still leave. You can still go. And she said, no, I have to tell him it's the right thing to do. It would have been easy. Just stay here. But instead, she went back. She was going to do whatever it took to make that family work. She went down to St. John to start over, and she had told me that he said, oh, when you come down here, it's, it's going to be great. Now reunited on the island of St. John, Laura gives birth to their second son in August of 2009. They name him Gentle. And then you have Gentle because now in my, in my maturity, I'm understanding what real masculinity is, and it's it's... It's gentle. She was a wonderful mother. She loved her boys more than anything, more than her own life. She was a good mother and she laid low and was a housewife. She wasn't into the party. They were kind of living two separate lives. And that's one of the reasons why he would hang out at my house, just so that he could 
do what he wanted and be himself because he couldn't do that at home. Party, stay out late, stay up all night. I never saw him like walk over and kiss her on the cheek or any of that. There wasn't that kind of in-person um, tenderness between them that I ever saw. The little baby, Gentle, needed some medical attention and thought that here in North Carolina would be a better place to get him the medical care he needed. So she made plans to move back to take care of her boy. Laura had left the island and he was kind of on his own. That wasn't really good for him because then he could just really do whatever he wanted. He knew how to charm a lady and charm the crowd alike. So it wasn't hard for him to have a group of ladies to chat with after he stopped playing. And he had no problem getting them to blush and getting a phone number. And sure enough, another woman soon makes waves in Grant's island life. Amanda, to me, was a striking woman. And Laura became concerned and suspicious and had a huge surprise coming her way. It appeared that things were going well in St. John. Grant was trying to get his music career going there. Good night, Don't give a ride to and Laura, she's living here in North Carolina with the two little boys, trying to get their youngest son needed medical treatment. And then it wasn't too much longer later that Amanda came into the picture. Amanda, to me, was a striking woman. Amanda's daughter, Shay, shared a lot of details with us, but she asked that we not use her last name. And what was your relationship like growing up? Uh, my mom was my best friend. My mom was my hero. Like, what do you want to be whenever you grow up? I want to be like my mom. Amanda had been married three times previously. And the most recent husband before Grant was a wealthy businessman in Texas. And he actually died in an accident. After his death, there's a lot of money that's, that Amanda inherits. Her big claim to fame was in acting. She was in the actual Stepford Wives, the remake that was done with Nicole Kidman. And she had a, a, a very small part. So how did she end up in St. John? She went down there on vacation. She was supposed to be gone for two weeks. She loved it so much. She moved down to the Virgin Islands. That was where she wanted to live. You lived there with her? I did. How old were you at that point? I was 20. And so how did she meet Grant Hayes? He was playing music. So it brought some people down there to listen to Grant play, and Amanda come in. She was looking at him like she hadn't eaten in a while, and he was a steak. Who pursued whom? The tango is two-sided. And did you see their infatuation romance unfold it was an instant it wasn't like oh my gosh fireworks oh i definitely started seeing him hanging with amanda and it was obvious that they were a couple i called him out for it i said man you can't be doing this with her up in the states you know we're up in the states he goes oh no no we're getting divorced and it's over she's staying up there she's never coming back to the island what was Grant's relationship like with Amanda? Yeah, I think with Amanda, because she was a little bit older, uh, more mature, I don't think that she was sort of pushed around and controlled. Got very territorial. Let's say there's a group of females in there, and one was, Grant and her were having too much eye contact and smiles, whatever. Then Amanda, being over here, would have the server bring her a drink, so that's from Grant's girlfriend. It kind of set her territory. And Laura, from a distance here in North Carolina, became concerned and suspicious there was something else happening there. Eventually this relationship between Amanda and Grant takes the next step. It develops into something more. And they make the move from the Virgin Islands to New York. She convinced him that she can introduce him to the people that can make his career take off. Was he successful? I mean, he got repeat bookings at some of the different places. You know, he played the the Grant Hayes variety show. Get a warm welcome yeah. for Mr. Grant Hayes. Yeah. 
And then Grant says, to Laura, I would really like little Grant, their oldest son, to come visit me in New York. Grant is shorter. This is just for 10 days. 10 days came and went, and he hasn't brought Grant back. And Laura was asking why. You said you would. And Laura had to file for custody to even see her son again. She didn't have a choice. Fighting to get her oldest boy back. In April of 2010, Laura hears surprising news. Grant calls her and says, Amanda and I just went to Vegas and we got married. It's a bombshell. It's a shock to Laura. It was a little surprising that they were getting married. They were definitely moving very fast. I <laughs> married my soulmate, uh, my best friend, and she is something that I wanted my whole life. Friends and family had been given the impression that Laura and Grant were married, but apparently they never were. Then Grant took a very aggressive move and went to court without her. He made these allegations about she's mentally unstable, she doesn't have a stable home, she's working as an escort. They had alleged that Laura was a danger to the children. He lied. He said several things in the ex parte custody order that just plain weren't true. And based on those allegations, Mr. Hayes got Judge Turner to sign an emergency custody order. He granted a temporary custody to Grant, not just little Grant, but also Gentle. And little Gentle was carted off from there and given over to his father. The worst time in her life was when she did not get to see her kids. She was devastated. She went to work to do whatever it would take to get the two boys back. As for Grant and Amanda, they moved down to Raleigh as the custody battle heats up. We had the court appoint Dr. Ginger Calloway. Where do you practice? In Raleigh. To evaluate both parties. To be able to give the court an opinion over whose home may be the best home for these children to be in. During that evaluation, Laura went on the record to say that Grant had isolated and controlled her, while Grant charged that she was the one manipulating him. When the psychologist report came in, the parts about Mr. Hayes referred to him having some, what the psychologist called, illogical and disturbed thinking. He rages angrily about Laura in front of the children. It is obvious they do not want Laura included in the children's lives. This is very concerning because, in essence, they want to obliterate her. And she came basically to the conclusion that, yeah, Laura had work to do. She is less mature than other adults and is easily overwhelmed. The psychologist did recommend a 50-50 split in custody. And that would have been a substantial improvement for where we were. In the meantime, Amanda had gotten pregnant. Lily in love. Lily in love? Yes. And gave birth to a little baby girl. All right. <laughs> they were thrilled to welcome baby Lily into the world, joining Grant's two sons. But that was overshadowed by Grant's struggles to break through in the music business. Between the legal proceedings and I think Grant's spending, they're out of money. It was a mess. Yes. He was the reason that my mom was not okay, sitting in a bathroom floor crying, going, I have no idea how the hell I'm going to do this. I mean, what do you do? You've gone through over $200,000 in 18 months. That's how much money they went through? Easily. How dire was the financial situation? Oh, they were getting evicted from their apartment. Grant called his mom, Patsy, and said, hey, we need to move in with you. Hey, Mom, it's Brad. Um, me and Amanda and Lily are going to move in with you guys. I uh, don't have the money for a storage building right now. If you could find that to me, okay? All right, bye-bye. It's now July of 2011, and while Grant and Amanda sink, Laura's fortunes were finally rising. Her main priority in life was to get her kids back. She went back to school. She, you know, got her own place, got her own job, got her own uh, car. She was very enthusiastic about the career and getting her boys back. Laura even started a new company with her friend Siobhan, selling ad space on restaurant menus. 
She successfully pitched local restaurant owners and socialized with new friends. I have to Molly. I don't know if we able to see it before 7, but I want to find out if they're going to be available after that at any point. But that's later. Laura sounds upbeat, but she has no idea that she's now driving straight into terrible danger. It's July 2011. Laura Ackerson hasn't been heard from in days, and her friends are worried about the 27-year-old mother of two. They report her missing. ABC 11 Eyewitness News at 5.30 starts right now. So far, there's been no other signs of the missing woman. I'm not the only person that's worried about her. She's been missing for quite a while, but, you know, there's still hope. Ackerson apparently came to Raleigh last week on business. We got a description of Laura's vehicle, and we put a bolo out, be on the lookout for patrol officers just to see if they are able to locate the vehicle. And that night, by 11 o'clock that night, our patrol guys had found the car. So where was it? Right over here, if you see this black color SUV, it's right there in that same parking space is yeah. where it was. Was there anything suspicious in the car? But nothing really of evidentiary value. I mean, we saw in the back seat there were car seats, you know, for the two boys. There was an idea that maybe she decided, hey, I'm going to go to the airport, I'm going to take a trip somewhere. If she had disappeared with her boys, that would not have been an overwhelming surprise. But to disappear without them, that was impossible. That was not Laura. So we definitely explored that possibility. We checked Laura's financials. We checked her cell phone uh, records, all that. All her activity ended on July 13th. She's not buying gas. She's not buying food. She's doing nothing. She just completely goes silent. Something that we would normally do in a missing person case is we want to go to their apartment or their house. Maybe they left a note. The police go into Laura's apartment and thoroughly search it, looking for anything that could point to a problem or that any violence occurred. That It was very well kept. It was clean. She had several plants that were inside the apartment. None of them had been watered for numerous days. That was a good indication that she had not returned or that nobody was coming in and out of the apartment to take care of things. From looking at the apartment, you could tell she's definitely a dedicated mother. That's what stood out, number one. Almost half the apartment is dedicated to space for the kids, and that kind of reflected her life, that you know, so much of her life was focused on her children. They pulled the video from the public spaces of Laura's apartment building the video captured the hallway outside of her door on the morning of the 13th. Just a lady that was on her way to work in the morning by herself. Completely normal morning. She was not under duress. Um, did not seem to be in a hurry. Did not have suitcases that she's dragging behind. We learned that Gentle had a birthday party the following weekend that was scheduled. And that Laura had no showed on it. Um, that's all when we started thinking this wasn't going to be just a normal missing person. We still want to look, hey, are there other people in Laura's life that may um, have something to do with her disappearance? Laura admitted that she'd gone to some sugar daddy sites. You're trying to meet maybe wealthier men. We were never able to show that there was any meeting of any kind between Laura and somebody else. One detective reaches out to Laura's ex, Grant Hayes, who says that Laura had visited him on the night of Wednesday, July 13th. He gives timeline of when she was there at the apartment. Well, she actually came up here to visit the boys and says that she left, you know, after being there for a little while. Grant Hayes also tells investigators that two days after visiting his apartment, Laura was supposed to meet him at the local Sheets gas station for their scheduled custody exchange. He shows up to the scheduled Friday, 5 o'clock time. He has the boys with him. They would come in the store to use the restroom. Grant goes in to buy a pack of cigarettes. But essentially, they're waiting in the parking lot. 
and waits for over an hour for Laura to arrive, and she never arrives. He was sending out very angry email messages and text messages to Laura. You're late again. Where are you? And first at 5.30 tonight, we have new details and new updates on the big stories happening now. I'm Steve Daniels. I anchor the evening news covering Raleigh. This was a really compelling case. Our viewers were watching this every step of the way. She was to meet them and their father in Wilson that afternoon, according to the children's grandmother. She didn't show up at 5, and so he was there until 5, and he called me at 6.30 and said she had not shown up yet. It's distressing, and I just hope it all comes to an end quickly and that she's all right. It's not like her to do something like this, especially to not pick up her kids. Detectives realize that no one has heard from Laura since that voicemail she left on July 13th for her friend. Oksana Smarsky. I was, I was in a study group and I saw my phone ring and I wish I would pick it up. And if I knew what would happen, I would not let it ring. Uh, I'm going to call when I'm done and I just want to let you know too. I don't know if we'll be able to see it before 7. But that's there. Laura's destination that night had been Grant and Amanda's apartment. Tell me... Where is the apartment? And so their apartment is right on the other side of this small building here. So how did you get a search warrant to go in? So we had developed enough information, I just think, to get that search warrant initially. We were really trying to develop a timeline for Laura. Any evidence that maybe Laura had been there? So one of the things that we did find in the apartment was a note. It appeared to be handwritten. up on the counter in the kitchen area, just kind of laying there very conspicuously, which was weird. And what that note said was that Laura Ackerson, in exchange for receiving $25,000, would give up custody of her children. It was signed Laura Ackerson. That was suspicious, because everybody had been telling the police Laura would not leave her boys. Those boys were Laura's life. She would have never signed over her children for any amount of money. Why a note? You already are going through the court system. Why don't you just go through your attorneys? And that is not the only curious discovery in that apartment. As soon as they opened the door, hit with the overwhelming smell of bleach. It's been a week since Laura Ackerson's disappearance, and investigators are now searching the apartment of her ex, Grant Hayes. Police were here yesterday asking a lot of questions. It's a um, three-bedroom apartment. There's a small kitchen area. I remember there being a couch, maybe a table, but there's not a lot of furniture. Was there anything unusual about that moment when you walked in the door? It smelled like bleach. You know, it's just that strong odor of bleach that hits you. And so, what did that tell you? At least that someone had been cleaning is what it appeared. And, but then we see this large, you know, bleach stain. At that point, alarm bells are going off. Right. And that's not like a little old stain. No, a significant bleach stain at, right at the entryway in the apartment. It was clear something happened right here at this door that required them to bleach this carpet. And then there were a couple other things that we find that kind of throw up red flags as well. The bathroom, which before July 13th had been the place where the little boys went to brush their teeth, take their baths, play in the bathtub, suddenly there was nothing in that room. It's the cleanest bathroom I've ever been in. There's no floor mats, there's no shower curtain. And like shiny clean on every possible surface. And what does that point to? That something has taken place inside this bathroom that required cleaning. And I think it really stuck out too because the rest of the home, it wasn't super dirty, but it was not clean to the level that that bathroom was clean. Clearly something happened in that bathroom. 
we did everything that you could do to a bathroom. We tore it apart. We ripped up the floor. We took out the plumbing and did everything that you could do forensically at that time. We even went to the apartment below, came up through the ceiling to get the plumbing, and nothing. There was nothing. There was no blood. Laura's body was not there. Nothing broken to indicate a struggle. So we still are kind of on the fence of what do we have here? So investigators now have a lot more questions for Grant and Amanda. But first, they have to find them. Detective Falk um, had learned that Amanda had a daughter. Her name was Shay. And Detective Falk conducted an interview with her. The police show up at your door. What was that like? Terrifying. I've never had a speeding ticket before. I've never been in trouble before. And so what did you tell them? Well, they wanted to know where my mom was. And I was like, what do you mean, where is my mom? And I was like, what is this about? And they were like, well, Laura's missing. And I was like, wait a freaking second. You guys need to find my mom. And I need you to find out where the babies are because they are probably not okay. Where Shay tells us, my mom and Grant, they took off and they went down to Texas. Grant and Amanda were loading the kids up and making a trip to Texas to visit Amanda's sister, Karen Berry. She was going to go visit my aunt because my grandmother had just died and she hadn't seen her sister in years. And I told my mom, I was like, I want to go with you. And she told me no. Amanda's daughter, Shay, tells police Grant rented a U-Haul trailer at this location on July 16th. That's three days after Laura went missing. Now what investigators want to know is why. So after finding that, I requested surveillance video from U-Haul here in Raleigh. Why'd they rent a U-Haul trailer? Well, according to Shay, there's this kind of antique hutch that she was going to give to my aunt. At this point, Grant and Amanda were downsizing their belongings as they were getting ready to move. I guess that Grant was like, Take it to your sisters, it'll be safe there. Did that sound odd to you? I mean, we've had this piece of furniture for like 20 years. Why are you worried about where it's going to be now? But whatever. Grant makes a comment when he goes to get the U-Haul trailer that he's going on a fishing trip with his son. The police wanted to know where Grant was, and so they checked his cell phone pings and found out that's, that he was in Texas. One of the first pings that we get on Amanda's cell phone is her sister Karen Berry's house. The court ordered that they were not allowed to take Grant and Gentle out of the state of North Carolina until the whole custody situation is resolved. It was definitely significant to us that he was willing to take the risk and go to Texas with these boys, knowing that if that was found out, that would be a problem for him. Pretty immediately, we make a decision, hey, we've got to go to Texas. This is literally a 20-hour drive on a hunch that we could find evidence out there. So Skinner Lane is in the middle of nowhere. Two deputies, myself, drove to Karen Berry's house cold. She didn't know we were coming. We told her that basically we wanted to talk to her about Grant and Amanda. She told us that she was expecting us. She was very, very nervous. She cried a lot. And she said, before I answer any more questions, do you mind if I pray? And it means there's something big that you're about to tell us. And as a homicide detective, anytime somebody wants to pray, you let them pray. My first reaction was, whew, this just got real. It was the lead story on the news, night after night after night. Grant shows up to the Friday handoff and waits for over an hour for Laura to arrive, and she never arrives. I can't imagine being under that Texas sun trying to find the woman's body. It was just a grotesque thing to have to do. And you would have to dive through murky water like this? It's not a swimming hole. It's not a place where people go paddling in. This is just sort of a wasteland. 
you found a manual for the power saw. What went through your mind? No one does construction work in this house. I'm just buying a saw at 2 o'clock in the morning. How the hell did we get here? As soon as prosecutors hear this song, they're like, wow. It was a song. Not real life. Until it is real life. When Laura first went missing, this case sort of blew up. A young woman who's a parent who suddenly had disappeared, and she really disappeared off the face of the earth. At this point in the investigation, we really don't know what exactly has happened to Laura. Grant and Amanda had gone down to Texas to visit Amanda's sister. They rented a U-Haul trailer. We knew that Grant and Amanda had come back to Raleigh. Where is Laura Ackerson? That's what everyone's been wondering since she went missing days ago. Raleigh police finally have what could be a breakthrough lead. So they drive 1,200 miles to pay an unexpected visit to Amanda's sister here in Richmond, Texas. Karen Berry was Amanda's sister, but in a lot of ways, she was more of a mother figure. She was who Amanda always turned to when she had any problems. Well, it was a Sunday afternoon, and I received a call out advising that the Raleigh Police Department had traveled from North Carolina, and they were requesting some investigative assistance from the sheriff's office. When they knock on the door of Karen Berry and she answers, it's almost like she was counting the minutes for them to get there. And her first reaction to them is, you can come in and I'll talk to you, but can I just have a moment to pray first? There's some soul searching going on. Yes. And do you remember the words that she prayed? Basically just a, a prayer of, give me the strength to do the right thing, to help me do what I need to do. After she finished praying, she tells us that Grant and Amanda had shown up on Monday the 18th. She's excited to see her sister, Lily, had just been born. And Karen had never seen her. She had never met Grant. Karen didn't get a very good impression of Grant because he was hyper nervous. Grant slept most of the day. Karen pointed that out. And she could tell something was wrong with her sister. Amanda seemed troubled, but also concerning were several inquiries that Amanda and Grant had made of her and her boys. What were the peculiar questions? Well, one was about the creek. Just across the street is Oyster Creek. Karen's boys, they had a flat bottom boat. Grant and Amanda, they were asking permission to use the boat to go out there to explore for sharks. Well, we're 90 miles inland, and this is a freshwater creek. I'm pretty confident there's never been a sighting of a shark in Fort Bend County. Grant asked, are there alligators where I can access Oyster Creek? And then they talk about they want to go fishing. They'll take the boat out fishing. And Karen said, no, that is not a place that you need little toddlers fishing. Karen told the police that they took the boat out one night. She didn't know why. The boys were sound asleep. So it didn't make any sense to her. We conveyed to her repeatedly that we are not looking at her as a suspect. And then we directed the conversation toward Laura. Did Grant and Amanda tell you anything? She clearly conveyed to me that Laura and Amanda did not get along. And then she told us Amanda had come into the kitchen and said, I need to talk with you outside. It's important. Amanda said, Laura's not a good person. Amanda then tells Karen, I hurt her, I hurt Laura, I pushed her, and it's bad. We asked her, do you think that Laura's dead? And Karen said, I think that there's a good chance. And at that point, she gave us consent to search the property. The scene was immediately cordoned off. There were several areas on the property itself that we needed to search, in addition to searching the creek across the street. This creek is off of Skinner Lane, off in Corbin County. We're about 100 yards west of the 4300 block. It looks different now, right? Yeah, things have changed a lot in the last 13 years. There were 
big piles of trash all in the backyard. There was a hog pen to the right of the house. You uncovered a lot of evidence here. We did. We uncovered a lot of evidence. Karen was asked what items were left behind. Are these yours or are these something that you know nothing about? We found some empty carry-on suitcases, presumably left by Grant or Amanda. We found some ice chests. Karen was not aware that they came down there with three coolers until she saw Grant cleaning them out in the backyard. If these were ice chests that were needed for their long journey to Texas from Raleigh, why weren't they needed during the long journey back? Fort Bend police call in crime scene investigator Officer Kim Oreskovich. They want her to search that muddy creek across the street from Karen Barry's house. When I got here is when the lieutenant told me that, hey, you're looking for a body. And so what was going through your mind? I was like, no, we're not going to find it. If, if, there, if there was dumps here in the creek, normally the current would take it out. The creek was probably 25 feet wide, very swampy looking. It's not a swimming hole. It's not a place where people go paddling in. This is just sort of a wasteland. There are alligators. They had someone in the boat ready to shoot an alligator. We're down, obviously, on our knees in the boat, so he's literally above us, watching for gators in front of us, see if there's any signs of a gator coming out. With a long gun in his hand. Absolutely. I can't imagine being under that Texas sun trying to find a woman's body. It is just a grotesque thing to have to do. What did you see? We're like, okay, there's something big floating on top of the water in the water lilies. My first reaction was, whew, this just got real. From the water to the riverbed, the search for Laura Ackerson continues. Laura's body believed to be dumped here in Texas. It was a hot July day when you went out on the boat. Yes. What did you see? We found something big floating on top of the water in the water lilies. And it was just white and pinkish. And when we got up close to it, you could see that it's one half of a torso. When they said, oh, you're looking for a body, I wasn't expecting dismembered body. So that was, that was a shock to your system. Kim pretty quickly locates what ultimately was determined to be two portions of a torso kind of tangled up in the vegetation of the creek. And that kind of confirmed to everybody here, now this is a homicide. Once those dismembered body parts were found floating near the surface of Oyster Creek, Houston dive teams were called in. They had to search now beneath the surface of these murky, alligator-filled waters, looking for more remains. They need to know, is it really Laura? It's becoming important to find things like the hands or the feet or the head that can help with identifying the body. Mark Thorson and Brian Davis of the Houston Police Dive Team still remember being on scene that awful day. What kind of dives do you normally do on this unit? We pretty much go get anything out of the water. Vehicles, guns, bodies. And what's visibility like underwater? Most of our dives on the dive team, we do not have visibility. You're basically just fanning your hand out or your arm out in front of you. You want to feel it before you run over it. The first two hours we searched underwater, we didn't come up with anything, so we had to change our tactic, and that's when we decided to go on our tiptoes and go through the lily pads. And you would have to dive through murky water like this? Yes. This is what we were facing. When you're in the middle of it, it just closes in back on it. It closes in on you. And it's difficult searching, or it's hard searching for what we're looking for. We started seeing sheen and smelling. If you've ever smelled a decomposing body, you, you know that odor. You, and you're not going to forget it. We're moving the lilies, and the scent would get stronger, or it would get weaker. As we're moving the lilies, you can see a white 
grayish object in the water and immediately knew that I had a body part. All I saw was what looked like skin and I could see a, a bone. I called out to Mark, Mark swam over and he placed his hands on top of mine and rolled it and that was when we, we learned that we had the head. We recovered virtually all of her body. But the most important piece was being able to recover her head because we were able to do dental record comparisons where that's as good as a fingerprint. They were able to confirm that it was Laura Ackerson and that that mother of two boys was now dead. And uh, they knew they found Laura in, in the Texas uh, Creek. Sorry. <laughs> what was your reaction when you heard about body parts being found in a creek near your aunt's house and somehow your mom's mixed up in it? It was the most devastating thing to have ever happened in my life. In my interviews with Karen, I was aware that Grant and Amanda were inquiring about where a Home Depot was at. They had some shopping that they wanted to do. Investigators visit a local Home Depot and uncover this video of Grant purchasing suspicious items, including muriatic acid. We had video evidence of the purchase of the muriatic acid, garbage can, and also some large cuff neoprene chemical resistant gloves. A Home Depot employee told law enforcement that Grant had asked if the acid would eliminate the odor from a hog pen. We searched the hog pen and we noticed a larger darkened spot, circular spot, right in the middle of the hog pen. In getting close to the soil, you could smell the chemical smell of presumably muriatic acid. So what do you think happened there? They attempted to dispose of Laura in that hog pen. Destroy and her? Yes. physical remains. Or at least means of identifying her. Despite having found Laura's body parts, the police still don't know how she was killed. But they do have enough evidence for arrest warrants for Grant and Amanda. We head down to Kinston to arrest Grant and Amanda at her parents' house. Then we take them into custody. Grant left a note on the dresser of his parents' house. And it said that he grants sole custody of Grant, Gentle, and Lily to his parents. He had to know that he was in a dangerous position. Both Grant Hayes and his wife Amanda are now in jail. Hayes and his wife Amanda are both charged with murder and the death of Laura Ackerson. Both pleaded not guilty. I even sent him a message. I said, Grant, what the hell, dude? What are you doing? Why, why you know? I don't know if he ever read it. He was incarcerated at that point. What was your reaction to her arrest and being charged with murder? Shocked. How the hell did we get here? I can't imagine a daughter watching her mother be arrested and charged with murder and have to contend with that. It's soul shattering. It makes you question your morals and values. It makes you question who you are. Soon, authorities find even more evidence they say will bolster their case. When you see the surveillance video, what went through your mind? It's scary. It's barbaric. It's inhumane. Soon after their arrest, Grant and Amanda are led into the courtroom. Are you Grant Ruffin Hayes? Yes. Jason Ackerson watched from the front row as the father of his sister's children faced a judge. Grant Hayes III is now charged with killing his children's mother. They have also charged his wife, Amanda Hayes, with murder. Today, both Hayes and his wife went back to jail with no bond. These guys are monsters. My mom's not a monster. She got pulled into a bad situation. That woman in that picture is not the mama that I grew up with. Shay. She didn't think her mother could be responsible for anything violent. At some point she had found this 
owner's manual for his skill saw. You found a manual for the power saw. For some type of power saw. What went through your mind? No one does construction work in this house. And I don't see anything freshly built. She made a decision to kind of help us. I figured if they had the manual, they could figure out where he bought it. And they did. It was Walmart that tells us, yeah, we actually sold one on the early morning hours of July 14th. They found Grant Hayes at 2.30 in the morning after Laura Ackerson was last seen on the 13th at Walmart buying supplies, plastic, gloves, PPE, plus a reciprocating saw. A reciprocating saw, depending on the blade you use, can rip through almost anything. The video shows him kind of pacing back and forth and looking at the different saws. You know, you wonder, like, what's going through his mind as he's doing this. He went in. He didn't disguise himself. He didn't try to cover up his looks. He didn't try to dodge cameras. He's very cool and calm and collected, knowing that he's got a dead body at home. I'm just buying a saw at 2 o'clock in the morning. I am a retired reporter with the ABC station in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. I'm at Crump right now in Raleigh. I was the crime reporter. Early in pre-trial motions, we started learning that the defense strategy for Amanda appeared to be to blame Grant. And for Grant, it appeared to be to blame Amanda. They both throw each other under the bus. They absolutely do. They both blame each other. It's like a murderous he said, she said, for sure. And it makes sense, right, if you're looking at it from a defense standpoint. For either one of them, you need to blame it on somebody else. Once it became clear from defense motions that one defendant was going to blame the other, the judge said if we do them separately, they both get a fair trial. Finally, two years after the murder of Laura Ackerson, Grant's trial begins. As an assistant district attorney, I prosecuted Grant and Amanda Hayes. On July 13th of 2011, Laura Ackerson woke up excited. Little did she know that within 24 hours, that that man, the father of her children, would be the one responsible for her murder and disappearance. I represented Grant Hayes. Another attorney, Will Durham, joined me. Our defense was, Grant didn't do this, there's no evidence he did this, and all the evidence suggests that Amanda is the perpetrator of the homicide. His attorneys made this point, and they were right. Just because Grant did a gruesome deed by disposing of a body and dismembering it doesn't mean he's a murderer. His mindset was very much, he didn't do this, he couldn't prove it, and, and he would be fine. In the two years since the murder, Grant Hayes has appeared in court several times. Some court observers say he often looks smug. Maybe that's because he thinks he can pin the murder of Laura Ackerson on his wife. What was Grant's demeanor like during the trial? Disgusting. He was so nonchalant. He had no problem. He was going to beat this. Does the attorney make all your witness? The way the prosecution decides to begin their case is to paint a portrait of Laura Ackerson. To do that, they bring in the people who know her best. Laura loved her children more than anything, and it showed in every action that she took. I told Laura that if she wanted to fight for her kids, I would be there to support her. And she said, I'm going to fight every step of the way. Could you state your name, please? Siobhan Nicole Mathis. Her main priority was to get her children back before anything else. Even when she was working, she would drop whatever she had to do for her kids. As we watched this case unfold, it was so striking to see the extraordinary lengths Grant and Amanda went to try to cover up their crime but they left a very clear trail behind them. Describe the range of evidence you had to deal with. The defendant went out and tried to find the best saw blade and the best plastic sheeting and acid. We were able to use these saw blades and had a scientist from NC State compare the saw marks in Laura's body. You can see how the blades actually match up. These coolers really were evidence of the deliberation and thoughtfulness that the defendant had after the murder. Could you unfold that and display that for the jury? It has some sort of bleach discoloration. Electrical tape that was purchased. 
despite this mound of evidence, we don't actually know how she was murdered. Sure. You know, there's three adults in the apartment when this happened, and two of them are charged with first-degree murder, and, you know, one person's dead. It was kind of hard to prove exactly what had transpired. I didn't have enough information with the parts um, that we received to determine the exact cause of death. What was the, your opinion as to the cause of death? I called it um, undetermined homicidal violence. The defense lawyers are telling that jury, look, there's no murder weapon. There's no exact cause of death. You can't find this guy guilty. The issue is who killed Laura and what happened and why. And the state really didn't have any direct evidence. This made the defense feel like there was a chink in the armor and that they had a way to get in. But soon, prosecutors would try to use Grant's own words against him. I got two three, three, baby. You. I can't get any more from you. As soon as prosecutors hear this song, they're like, wow. Despite the mountain of evidence in this case, it's still unclear. Who killed Laura and how? The prosecution is about to call a witness who claims to know what happened. Here is jailhouse informant Pablo Trinidad who can tell us what Grant said happened inside that apartment. Pablo Trinidad met Grant at the Wake County Jail where they were both behind bars. Pablo was being held for drug-related offenses. He's the typical snitch witness. He was doing maybe 25 years. He was looking a way to try to get a sentence reduction. Were y'all housed in the same area of the jail? Yes, ma'am. We had several conversations throughout the period that we was housed together. Pablo Trinidad got in front of that courtroom on the witness stand, and he said, Grant told me in our jail cell, he and Amanda strangled Laura. He said he pissed the call to her and lured her to his apartment. And that's when him and his wife subdued her, subdued her and strangled her. With the corroborating evidence, there was this glimmer of truth in there. Whether you want to believe what he's saying, you know, you got to take it with a grain of salt. You can't prove it other than, it's, you know, this is just my word. Your testimony is that during that five days, y'all developed such a special bond that he told you all his deepest, dark secrets. That's correct. Defense lawyers chipped away at Pablo. They knew that Pablo had snitched on other cellmates before. And so you started thinking back, what are all the names I can give these people, didn't you? Yes. And you remember Grant Hayes. He was your meal ticket, wasn't he? One of them, at least. If you want to put in those words, that's your words, not mine. I can show you, Mr. Nunn. I hate to say that a jailhouse snitch was a pivotal witness in this case, but he was. The prosecution has one last piece of evidence, and fitting for Grant, it starts with a beat. Shay actually brought to our attention. She knew about this song that Grant had previously recorded. It was called Broomstick Rider. Broomstick Rider, uh, Grant just Hayes. happened to be my baby's mama. Uh, Deshaun, you got me. Me. The lyrics of it told what his desire to do to Laura was. I put a price tag on your head. That's right. You must have told your attorney I got intentions on killing you. The sort of might stop me. My bullets to get you. He wrote this song with Laura in mind. His attorney called it a parody. The state at this time would seek to publish a song that was recovered off of the defendant's iPod. The defense objected to the song, saying it wasn't relevant. But the judge overruled and allowed it in. We both kind of peer over and see the defendant I got two three, 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 baby. bobbing his head and sort of rocking out to the song about killing the person that he was on trial for killing, which is uh, sort of a staggering event. It was a song. It was a song. Not real life. Until it is real life. And it messes up your entire existence. It messes up who you think you are at your core. Can we take a second?
the defense calls a witness with crucial first-hand testimony that seems to support Grant's version of the story. It's Amanda's sister, Karen Berry. Remember, Amanda told her sister that she hurt Laura. Could you please state your name for the court? Karen Berry. Could you tell me how you know Amanda Hayes? She's my sister. The defense is trying to prove Grant didn't commit this crime, that it was Amanda who committed this crime. Our case focused on statements that Amanda made to her sister. She came in and she told me that she had hurt Laura and that she had hurt her bad. She says, I hurt Laura, not we hurt Laura or he hurt Laura. It actually benefited Grant to some degree because for Grant, you know, his defense is Amanda did this. Well, that was definitely a defense bombshell. But when she was pressed further, she detailed another story that happened. I said, I want the truth out of you now. And I looked her straight in the eye and I asked her if she was covering for Grant. How did she answer? She looked me straight in the eye. She shook her head and went. Well, that kind of undid everything else. The defendant's whole case sort of backfired on them. I mean, Karen's testimony did not come out like they wanted it to come out. In their closing arguments, each side has one last chance to convince the jury. They're trying to give you some reason to convict him without giving you the evidence. You will not let emotion decide this case. You will not let your disgust for the things that happened in this case lead you to a verdict. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I really wanted to communicate to the jury that the way that this murder happened was different. It was more personal. Here's the saw. And so that's why I pulled out that saw. This saw cut someone in half. These are the lengths that the defendant went to to try to not just get away with this murder, but also erase Laura from the world. He is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and you should find him so. Thank you. After three weeks of graphic testimony with 50 witnesses and 500 pieces of evidence, the jury goes out to deliberate. Within two hours, they're back with a verdict. We, the jury, by unanimous verdict, find the defendant, Grant Ruffin Hayes III, to be guilty of murder in the first degree. Grant Hayes was sentenced to life in prison without chance of parole. I was happy to see that he got that, and I was happy to see that the jury felt the same way. Glad he's not going to be part of society. It is consolation for that factor, but still doesn't bring her back. Only a couple of months later, it's time for Amanda to face justice. Amanda took the witness stand in her own defense. I was just doing whatever he told me to do. Grant did not testify, but now he's talking to me. This is a global telling. We take calls from Grant Hayes. Oh. Hey, Grant? Yes. It's Juju Chang at ABC News. This is a global telling. Prepaid call from Grant Hayes. After Grant's trial and conviction, many questions remain unanswered, like what happened in that apartment. So we arranged to speak with him from prison. But his claims about how Laura died doesn't really add up. Grant, can you hear me? It's Juju Chang yes. at ABC News. Thanks so much for calling. Thank you for picking up. So let me ask you this. People have described you as very charming, but also manipulative and even scary. I don't really have any defense for what people think about my character. But, you know, I'm not in prison for being a bad person. I'm in prison for killing a woman. And that didn't happen. So you're saying you didn't kill Laura? No, I didn't kill Laura. So what happened that night in the apartment? How did she die? From what I was told, uh, when I left the room, she had asked to hold our five-week-old baby, and Amanda had refused her. And Amanda told me that Laura had actually grabbed her by the hair and pulled her back, and that she had swung back with her elbow, hit her, dislodged herself from her, and ran into my recording studio. And when I came back in the room, Laura was laid out.
I just want to get this straight, Grant. You're blaming Laura for her own death? Laura attacked the woman. I don't know any other way to look at it. And so, at that point, why not call 911 to try to resuscitate her? I was freaked out. Honestly, I was afraid. I was very, very afraid. And then you're captured on video buying a saw. Who came up with that plan? Well, Amanda had a plan to take Laura's body to a swamp at her sister's in Texas. And we had to get it out of the house. And the only way we could do that was if it were dismembered. So I guess you could say it was uh, carrying out a plan that was Amanda's. It's only been a few months since Grant's conviction, and now Amanda Hayes' trial is set to begin. In Amanda's trial, we're still putting forward the same evidence as Grant's trial, but at the same time, we want to accent Amanda's role in everything. The defense was trying to show Amanda she was coerced by Grant and only did what Grant said in order to protect herself and her child. But Amanda isn't just sitting there idly. She is an active participant in everything that we see. In Texas, there was a, a camera trying to catch people illegally dumping or littering, and it captures exactly that. Where are we in relation to where her sister's house is and where the body parts were found? We're just a mile and a half down. At my particular unit, we were in charge of environmental crimes. At that time, the camera was set up right where you see these right two there. trees. Um, saw something was odd in the photos. The female that got out of the truck started unloaded boxes and jugs and started shoving them under the tree in this fence line right behind me. She was shoving it into the bushes. And then I found some boxes of acid. Seemed really strange. And I had watched the news the night before showing her court appearance in Raleigh. And so how did you put that two and two together? They looked the same, looked like the same lady. It was kind of really basic. People look at that and say, she doesn't look like she's under duress. She doesn't look like she's afraid. A picture can tell a thousand words, but it can hide a thousand words too. What do you think that picture was hiding? I think that that picture shows a still frame of a woman thinking she's out in the middle of nowhere in the country and just trying to hurry up, get it over with, get it done. And my question is, if you are driving a vehicle down the road, dumping evidence, and you are so scared, keep driving. Go to the police. Go somewhere for help. The one difference between these two trials, we found out Amanda would testify. I think the defense had decided that if she went on the stand, she had a way of projecting innocence. Right now we're going to begin with the North Carolina trial of a woman accused of killing the mother of her stepchildren. Taking the stand for the first time this week, Amanda Hayes' defense was simple. I was just doing whatever he told me to do. Her husband made her do it. How would you describe her? Um, strong, poised, uh, well-rehearsed, but in a very sweet, almost sing-songy baby voice. Amanda, did you kill Laura Ackerson? No, sir, I did not. Did you help Grant kill Laura Ackerson? I absolutely did not. Were you present when Grant killed Laura Ackerson? No, sir, I was not. Grant told me that Amanda killed Laura in self-defense, but Amanda says it began with an accident. The picture that Amanda paints inside that apartment on the night of the murder has Laura bumping into Amanda as Amanda is holding their newborn baby. And describes Laura falling to the ground. Amanda Hayes says she had no idea Laura Ackerson had died after Ackerson was injured at the Hayes Raleigh apartment. She says she left with the children when Ackerson fell and hit her head. I think she hurt her own credibility by telling these implausible stories about she came back after a couple of hours and had no idea that Laura had been killed and her body disposed of. You can't even do all that in a couple of hours. This is a small apartment. Dismembering somebody takes a lot of things. Seems hard to believe it, that your mother didn't know. It seems hard. It does seem hard to wrap your head around. It does. I know you love your mom. I know you support her. Could it be that you're, you're seeing it through rose-colored glasses? Absolutely. And that perhaps she was more involved than you'd like to believe? 
nobody will ever know what they don't know. She also testified that her husband threatened to kill her if she didn't help dispose of the body. He told me that, um, um, that I had to help figure out how to get rid of this body or else none of us were making it back to North Carolina, to Raleigh. Did it ever seem to you like she could have also been a victim of Grant Hayes? You know, I feel like there's a possibility that Amanda was a victim of Grant's charisma, Grant's narcissism. But beyond that, I don't believe that she was a victim of anything. No one knows what that relationship's like, but... And those pictures on Amanda's camera reflect Amanda having a good time and smiling the whole time. Amanda Hayes is a former bit part performer who attended acting school in New York. But according to one of the prosecutors, none of her acting jobs were as good as the one she gave in this courtroom. She is given the performance of her life. She came across as sympathetic. She came across as, you know, Grant's the controlling jerk and I just got swept up in all this. We're asking that you find her not guilty on both charges. But would the jury believe Amanda? We may never know what kind of verdict Amanda Hayes expected. If it was something different than what she got, her face didn't show it. And what does Grant make of it all? Laura's death killed me. You're saying essentially that you're the victim in all of this. Last night that I was with Grant, he handed me a notepad with these pages on it. Told me that it was important lyrics and that it was going to be worth money one day. But this was probably the most unsettling of the poetry that I found. I guess it's one sentence with the word murder in it six times. It's uh, murder, 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 murder in my veins, murder in my soul. Desertless in my heart, but to let this all go. And I think that's what just really upset me a little bit and had goosebumps when I read that for the first time after finding out about Laura. Dramatic testimony in a first degree murder case. Did her husband force her to cover up his crime? It will be up to the jury to decide if Amanda Hayes was his accomplice or another victim. It's time for Amanda to face justice. They wanted Amanda found responsible for her role in the death of Laura to the tune of first-degree murder. It is the unanimous verdict of the jury that the defendant is guilty of murder in the second degree. Amanda was convicted of the lesser charge of second-degree murder, and she was sentenced to between 13 and 17 years in a North Carolina prison. They were both there. They both had the opportunity to save Laura's life. Neither one of them did it, so to me, that makes them both guilty of first-degree murder. What was your reaction to the verdict against your mom? It was a glimpse of hope. Why is that? Because it wasn't life with no chance of parole. Amanda is later tried and convicted in Texas for tampering with evidence, resulting in an additional 20 years in prison. What does justice look like for her? I think more of it is what does justice look like for Laura and those little boys. Who actually delivered a death blow? I don't know if Grant did it or if Amanda did it. The fact is, this husband and wife collaborated to kill this woman. Despite being convicted for killing Laura, Grant remained steadfast in defending his image. It doesn't sound to me like you have a lot of remorse about Laura's death. Let me tell you something about my remorse and Laura's death. Laura's death killed me, killed my family. So I think I'm the most remorseful person. I am the one who everyone points at and says, he did this. He's the bad guy. He's the monster under the bed. It's just not true. You're saying essentially that you're the victim in all of this. No. Amanda and Lillian were the victims. What, if any, regrets do you have in this whole matter? I regret that we took her body apart. Ooh. It just colors the way that people are going to see me for the rest of my life. When you think about Laura, what comes to mind? I talk to her. 
I ask her to always watch over all of the kids. And I tell her thank you for watching over me. Today, all three of Grant's children are being raised by his own mother. The kids have no contact with Grant or Amanda. Those boys were Laura's life. She was doing everything to have a better life for them. She was a wonderful mother. She loved her boys more than anything, more than her own life. We should point out tonight that Grant Hayes has filed several appeals. All have been denied. He tells 2020 he's continuing to fight for freedom. Meanwhile, his ex-wife, David, Amanda, is in a Texas prison serving out her conviction. She declined to be interviewed. That's our program for tonight. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Deborah Roberts. And I'm David Muir from all of us here at ABC News in 2020. Good night.